All right. Well, I think we're going to get started. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, to the American Traffic Safety Services webinar. Today's presentation, Sharing Safety Marketing and Partnerships to Create Safer Roads. This is the fourth of four um, webinars brought to us by the Roadway Worker Protection Council, uh, the fourth in its series. Um, we have today um, Alex Kelly from Salt and Company, who will be giving um, today's presentation. If you have any questions um, at all, please feel free to use the Q&A option on the Zoom navigation bar. The chat feature is, is not available, so please use the Q&A uh, feature at any time. Uh, this webinar will be um, is being recorded, and we will post it to ATSA's website um, within um, two to three business days. So thank you for, uh, for joining us today. And Alex, I'm going to pass it on to you. Thank you so much, Pamela, and thank you so much to everybody for joining us for the last in this series. Um, so today we are talking about sharing safety, and just to give you um, a bit more insight into what we're focusing on today, it's really about how to tell compelling stories about the work that you're doing, leveraging partnerships to increase the awareness of roadway workers and the projects that you're doing. And really this webinar today comes at um, kind of the perfect point given everything else that we've talked about in the last year or so. Um, so throughout my time with ATSA, we've looked at a number of different topics. First off, Road Safety 101, then looking at effective incident response, what happens right there on the side of the road and how do you move forward? And then backing up a little bit and looking at the safety supports that you can create within your organization and how that relates to a safety culture. Now, with today's presentation, we're all looking at how to share safety. I think we're all bombarded, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but we're bombarded with messages when it comes to safety marketing um, and safety on our streets. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we can protect everybody, make sure they get home at the end of the day. And so it's really important to find ways to share those messages beyond um, just your normal audience to ensure that you're educating the most, uh, the greatest number of people about the important work that folks are doing um, on, in, and around the roadways. So because we're talking about marketing and communication, I've kind of pulled a little bit from the five W's and H, who, what, where, why, and how. Um, and for our sort of structure of the presentation today, uh, we're looking at why you wanna share these um, messages, how you're going to share them, who to share with, and what that looks like. And for me, it's really important, given my background, to start with a little bit more about kind of the, the cognitive um, science behind it, as well as best practice from the research. So if this is the first time that we've met, my name is Alex Kelly, um, and I'm the founder and CEO of Salt and Company, and we really focus on strategy, communication, and partnership. So today's presentation is at the heart of what I love. And I've spent a long stretch of my career focusing on road safety and transportation, um, both working with ATSA as well as um, in Canada with a number of different organizations. I'm based in Canada uh, with roots in the US, so I'm kind of both sides of the border, um, but have worked on a number of key projects like the Vision Zero Advocate Institute, and then also through my consulting firm, worked with clients like Uber, ATS Traffic, who's an ATSA member, on the insurance, and a number of other ones. My background, like I mentioned previously, is in public health. Uh, so I come to this, this traffic safety world from most likely a very different uh, viewpoint than many of you in terms of my background and training, but also my approach and how I, I see things. And so that's where when we talk about traffic safety and injury prevention, it all ties back to that public health. And so I pull a lot of these presentations from some of those central tenants when it comes to best practice for uh, behavior change, um, health behaviors, that kind of thing. One of the things, and if you've been to any of my presentations before that I love to talk about is that idea of a safety blind spot that we all have. And we, know the term blind spot, especially all of us working in transportation. It's that area where a person's view is obstructed. So in a vehicle, 
usually that's kind of right over your shoulder, left, right. Um, and you always want to make sure that you can check it because it's where your mirrors don't um, illuminate your, your view. But when we talk at safety uh, blind spots, oftentimes these are things we're not seeing because of a number of different excuses or things that we tell ourselves. So you can see on the screen there, a safety blind spot could be same old, same old, one and done. We're doing pretty well. We don't need to change anything. We can't make everybody safer. We can't reach everybody with what we're doing. We're doing enough. Or I never thought of it that way. And I'm not really going to change my thinking. Or I'll get to it one day. It's on my to-do list. We'll figure it out then. And the thing is, is when we start to settle into those safety blind spots, uh, you can get complacent. Things don't change. And the truth is, is that the world is a very dynamic place. And so is safety. And if you're a member of ATSA, most likely your work environment is very dynamic as well. Whether you're doing different projects all over the place, whether you have different clients, whether you've got different vendors, uh, whether you're doing different road closures, or you've got staff in different locations. So you can't afford to have a safety blind spot because your world is always changing. Nothing is static. And I think it's really important too, when we're thinking about today's topic of sharing safety, that we also identify maybe in your organization, there's currently a safety blind spot about communication related to the work that you're doing. Maybe you send out a press release once a year, or you kind of do the standard social media stuff, or maybe you don't even have a social media account because you're too busy and there's too many things going on. And I'm not gonna be here making a case for an Instagram account all day long. That's not what I'm here for. But I think really today, I'm encouraging everybody on the line to think about the ways that they're talking about safety and think about ways they can stretch and expand and become a little bit more dynamic. Because the truth is, is when we're talking about road safety, it's a very cluttered ecosystem right now. There's a lot of different conversations that are happening around traffic safety, but also about transportation, the innovation that we're seeing, the different types of transportation uh, that are out there, the different legislation, whether you're looking at it from a sustainability aspect or an accessibility aspect, or you know, just uh, your normal tickets and, and bills and things like that. So it all makes up this kind of larger picture of transportation. And the thing is, is when we're having a conversation about transportation, we need to really consider that there's a lot happening in that space. And so we're going to talk about how we actually break through that noise. So some of you who are at um, the ATSA convention last year may recognize this. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, really what I love to think about is that safety blind spot. So our blind spot in terms of uh, transportation and road safety is a bit of a continuum. And so I kind of uh, mentioned these, these terms previously, but we've got static on one end and dynamic on the other. And you'll have to excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. <laughs> so static is really doing things that the way they've always been done. Your head's down, you're focused on your operations. And what I like to say is that you're insulated from innovation. Uh, so you're doing things that they've the way they've always been done. And a lot of times this is fine, this is safe. You know, you're doing, you're doing what you should, you're, you're clicking out at the end of the day and the job is done. But unfortunately the world we live in is not static and we need to be responsive to that. That's where this whole idea of dynamic um, parts of the continuum come in. And this is really looking at that opportunity to change how things are done. It's a changing of the guard. And it also offers a continual learning opportunity for both yourself, your colleagues, and the industry at large. And then it's always looking outside the industry for new ideas. And that's what you'll hear from me today about, is how do we take something that's happening in a different industry and apply it to transportation? And communication is a brilliant or example of that. There's a lot of things happening in that space that can really help to revitalize and refresh how we talk about transportation, so it doesn't just become a means to an end in terms of getting from point A to point B, but something that people all around your workspace can really care about just as much as you do. So now that we've talked a little bit about why this matters, let's get into the specifics of sharing safety messaging. 
So the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about is what kind of social or safety messaging we're talking about here. And I really like talking about social marketing. And this is the first thing is, you know, it's not social media marketing, which traditionally you'd think of social media and think of Instagram, and Facebook and Twitter and adding to that conversation. However, social marketing is more of marketing for good. We're really focusing on a behavior change, not a purchase decision. And what we see in uh, some of the articles about it is really focusing on social marketing that captures attention and spreads awareness about a social issue through creativity and emotion. So here on the, the slide, you'll see two amazing um, examples that kind of juxtapose social marketing versus a traditional marketing. So the slide on the top is tailgating isn't worth it. And it's a billboard that looks crumpled like a car has hit the back of um, a semi. And then the other one is a Volvo ad, which says big game, big win. I'm just looking at my other monitor here. Safety can be a game changer. We're giving away $1 million of cars to celebrate 1 million lives saved. And there's actually, at first glance, you may not think there's a big difference here. Both ads or both pictures are talking about safety. Volvo, we know, has had a tremendous safety record and they're celebrating that and they're giving away cars. That seems very altruistic and incredible. But at the end of the day, the top ad, tailgating isn't worth it. And you can see, if you can't see, and my slides can be shared later, the top right-hand corner of that billboard, it says, give trucks room, it's the law. That ad at the top is all about changing a behavior. They're shocking you with the display, the visual piece of it, giving you an example of what can happen and telling you what you can do to prevent it by giving trucks room. Volvo, on the other hand, at the end of the day, they really are selling cars. They're giving away cars. But this is really promoting a singular brand and an idea and trying to influence a purchase decision. So that's the, the big change or the difference here between social marketing and a more traditional type of marketing. Traditional marketing is not bad. You need to sell your services to keep the lights on, to keep your employees um, employed. But today we're really talking about safety and that comes before profit. And we've talked about that in a variety of other webinars that I've done. But I really wanted to make that distinction because it is important when we're starting to think about the messages we share and why we're doing it and also how we structure things. So what does sharing safety really look like? So it could be a number of things. When we're thinking about the very specifics of uh, the primary function of a number of ATSA members' uh, organizations, you may be doing roadway construction. You may be shutting down lanes of traffic, doing a temporary diversion. So you may want to do messaging around new traffic flows or projects or changes to uh, status quo. You may want to have more of a public service announcement type of advertisement or marketing effort that talks about not passing work vehicles um, or passing slowly, giving them room, illustrating the dangers of on-site work like flagging or contributing to a larger conversation. Remember that static piece of outside of your traditional vertical within transportation um, and looking at the bigger opportunity for innovation. So there's a number of different ways to share safety. It could be that project on the ground, could be a more kind of global look at what your organization does, or it could be looking at how your organization contributes to a larger safety and transportation conversation. So now that we've talked a little bit more about why these things are important, I wanted to get into a little bit more of the behind the scenes, a little bit of theory, but not boring theory. I think it's very interesting around how we can structure messaging to impact behavior change in a really positive way. So this is where the public health piece comes in. And also I bring in some of my communication work that I've done with some of my other clients. When we think about marketing in general, um, one of the things that a traditional marketing, so maybe the head of marketing at Volvo or Pepsi or Coca-Cola or anybody like that looks at is this idea of the rule of seven. And people need to hear an advertiser's message at least seven times before they'll take action to buy that product or service. So think about the last thing that you bought. 
maybe it was an iPhone, maybe it was a new watch, maybe it was shoes, maybe it was the snow tires that you bought for your, new, your vehicle. All of these things, you probably didn't just see that product once and then decide to purchase it. You may have seen it in a flyer for your local um, store. You may have seen an advertisement on television. Perhaps you got a pop-up ad on a website that you were visiting. Maybe you heard about it on the radio. The thing is, is advertisers, they're smart. They look at human psychology and they know that they have to consistently come back to you with the messaging so that really starts to imprint on your mind. And all of a sudden you go from never hearing about this to having it feel like it's front and center. And certainly this rule of seven now with social media and everything that we're seeing in that space, probably that rule of seven is um, has probably doubled or tripled. Because when you look at any sort of web search, let's say you Google those snow tires on the internet, all of a sudden you see Bridgestone ads popping up on your Facebook page. Because now we're seeing within um, digital marketing online, uh, almost like a little um, breadcrumb trail of where you've looked on the internet and advertisers use that to then target you in other places so that you continue to see their messaging. So that's one of the really critical things that we look at is that people need to hear and see things a number of times to make a decision. And why? You may know, hey, I was going to buy snow tires anyways. I wasn't influenced. But marketers also know that typically people are exposed to about four to 10,000 ads every single day. Everything is cluttered. Even look at this slide right here. We've got Atsa's logo, we've got my logo, and now I've added a whole picture with a bunch of other logos. You're being exposed to things everywhere you turn, no matter if you look down at your phone, which probably has a logo on it. The computer that I'm coming through Zoom on has a logo on it. But then as soon as you step out of your office, you drive home, you pick up a newspaper, look at it online, you're exposed to all of these different things. So and when we think about our safety messaging, don't feel like all hope is lost, but know that we have to find a way that's creative and persistent to be able to crawl through all of the other noise that's out there. The other piece that I wanted to layer on top of all of this is the fact that we're not just looking at a purchase, uh, you know, whether that's something small like uh, a piece of clothing or maybe something at the pharmacy or something like that versus a big purchase like a new car. We're actually asking people not just to make one behavior decision, we're asking them to change their behavior. So if we want them to slow down and move over, if we want them to stop texting and driving, if we want them to drive sober, we need to constantly come back to this messaging because everybody is always in a different stage of behavior change. And again, public health, we're coming back to this. So this um, sort of pyramid here on the right talks about how everybody is always in a different stage of readiness to change. So it starts at pre-contemplation at the bottom and then moves through contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. So really, you may introduce an idea to somebody. Perhaps it's about, I'll take another public health behavior. Perhaps it's about smoking. And you're trying to impact somebody's behavior around smoking and, and get them to quit. And so pre-contemplation, that person may not know that smoking is bad for them at all. So you need to start to introduce the idea and give them the knowledge and the information about that behavior. And then they move into contemplation. Now they're aware of the problem and what that solution could be. So we now know smoking, not great for you. And there is a solution you can quit. And here's some different ways. Preparation, that's when that person intends to take action. So maybe they've created a plan for themselves. They're going to wean on themselves off. Maybe they're going to look at some alternative methods, um, some replacements, some whatever, uh, uh, gamifying it with friends about how much money is they'll save. A lot of different you know, apps, tools, tricks, nicotine, all that kind of stuff for this example. So they're intending to take that action. And then they actually take the action. So in this example, be quitting smoking. And then they move into the maintenance. So 
the thing about behavior is it's not a one and done kind of thing. You need to constantly come back to it. So what is it that helps you maintain that, that behavior change? So again, to come back to our example, maybe that is, you know, choosing to do something differently with what was normally a break in the day to have a cigarette. Um, maybe that is, you know, picking up a Sudoku game or, you know, no longer hanging out with friends that, that also smoke or, um, choosing to save all that money and buy something new as a reward. So you constantly see the, the reward or the gain of your behavior change. And this is just an example of how people move through it. So if we want somebody to stop speeding, it's a similar kind of thing or stop uh, driving while distracted and being on their phone. We need to create an awareness of the problem and then take them through that uh, solution piece and then help them understand how they can take that action themselves. So when we look at this, this pyramid, it's not only about kind of pre-contemplation and contemplation and all these different words, it's also making sure in a very simplistic sense, you'll, you show them what the problem is and you make sure that problem relates to them. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And then you also show them a solution and empower them to take that solution. So for example, if we're looking at um, a unsafe driving behavior and um, you know somebody's speeding and they're on the highway and they don't realize that that's really dangerous to unprotected um, workers on the side of the road, like a flagger, um, it's really making them aware that flaggers are some of the most vulnerable folks on a road crew, um, that they don't have any protection and that they rely on drivers to slow down and pay attention and, and follow their direction. And then it's also, you know, giving them a solution. And this is a bit of a, an expanded of scope in terms of the example, but giving them a solution that matters to them. So it's saying, okay, you need to slow down and you need to approach uh, a construction or work zone with, with care. And we actually recommend, you know, slowing down X hundred feet before, um, before you see these signs and coming to a full stop. Because remember, they may not have the education or the ex previous experience to understand what to do in that situation. So you need to give them that solution that applies to their reality um, and then constantly come back. So we can't just educate somebody once. That's why we always have signs out in a roadside uh, work zone. And constantly coming back, helping people to maintain. It's not as clear cut as the smoking piece, but that's where we constantly have to rethink our approach, knowing that there's a number of different steps. We can't just tell somebody something once and hope it goes through. And to that point, my most favorite picture of all is one size fits all. And the thing is, is when we're looking at safety messaging, even in that very complex example I just gave you kind of off the top of my head around flaggers and awareness, is that one size doesn't fit all. And so what may work with one individual may not work with another individual. Um, so the individual who's speeding to get to work on time may have a very different approach to the individual who's not paying attention because they're checking their phone for an important work email. They may need kind of a different uh, delivery and it always is better if you have a united approach. And so that's kind of why I like this ad or this little um, comic as well. It's not just one approach and it's not just one channel. You need all of these different players to really help create messaging that sticks long-term. So I'm gonna give you a bit of a case study on this one. And I can't really do a show of hands here, but just think, do you know where the term designated driver comes from? So the person who will drive um, their friends who chose to drink at the bar home at the end of the night or after a party, do you know where that came from? It was actually a campaign with the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, and in 1988, they started the US designated driver campaign. And one of the things that they wanted to do was collaborate with Hollywood to basically subtly weave in the concept of distract, or sorry, of designated driving into some of the most popular shows on television at the time. So Cheers, which this is an example of on the uh, picture. Cheers, uh, The Cosby Show, a number of other ones. And they just wove it in with a couple of lines um, written in about, you know, who is going to be the designated driver that night? Who is going to be DD? Or in this scene, uh, Rhea Perlman's 
um, picking kind of the names out of a hat of who was going to have to be the distracted, or excuse me, the designated driver that night. And this was a brilliant campaign because it didn't make a big fuss about it. It just subtly put it into mainstream media. And the other thing was, is that it focused on a modest shift in behavior. It didn't say no one ever drink again. Don't do it. Um, why are you even watching Cheers? This is about alcohol, alcohol and driving, bad. It wasn't that. It said, if you're going to choose to drink, make sure you have a safe ride home. And the other really interesting thing is it became such a success because it offered a positive thing and it told people what they could do, not what they shouldn't do. And then also it was bolstered up by other PSAs that were shown around the television show, like during the commercial break. And because of that, we saw designated driver go from a very poorly understood concept to something that became mainstream very, very quickly. The other sort of messaging that I wanted to introduce, and maybe some of you have heard of this one before, is that there was a satirical campaign in the US uh, around the same time actually as the designated driver piece. And these cigarettes were put out and they were literally called death cigarettes and their tagline was, these will kill you. And it was really to draw attention to the fact that cigarette companies did not have good intentions when it came to buying their product. And the thing was, is that we didn't see positive empowerment, didn't show us what we could do instead of smoking. It didn't subtly weave it in. It was very in your face. And these cigarettes flew off the shelves. You couldn't keep them in any shops in the UK. And they were actually then, when the UK banned them, they were sent out to Scandinavia. So these death cigarettes, while it was made to draw attention to a very dire health um, issue, it actually blew up in their face and started a backlash. And people really, they weren't, uh, like I said, empowered to change their behavior and it wasn't giving them the right idea of what they could do. So it's just an interesting compare and contrast in terms of the designated driver and then the death cigarettes. These are different messaging with subtleties in terms of how they were um, pitched to the public and how that performed for them. So let's talk about your messaging. The book here on the screen is one I would highly recommend if you're starting to look at how to communicate more effectively relative to safety, but relative to any marketing message. Uh, this is a very engaging read. It's not a dry read at all. And uh, there's a couple of key principles in here that I'd highly recommend. So when we want a message to stick, so that sticky message idea, what do you want out of your audience? You want them to pay attention. You want them to understand and remember. You want them to believe that they can do it, but also believe in you as a credible source. They need to care about what they're doing, and then they need to have the tools to take action. So again, you can see this parallels with that designated driver example, but maybe how that death cigarette example fell short. They also put forward a framework for success and that uh, lack of an S on the end is not a mistake. Um, so success really can stand for simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional, and stories. So the idea of telling stories to illustrate um, your point. And these things combined with um, what you want your audience to do really starts to create a foundation for an idea that has more staying power than just any of those other messages that we are constantly being bombarded with every single day. So that's how we start to break through the fold. The other thing I wanted to come back to when we're looking at how to really make sure these messages stick is that power of language. So I've said it a couple of times already, but really thinking about your message delivery. So having something positive and empowering, and this is particularly important for uh, behavior change. Oftentimes when we scare people with what they shouldn't do, so I'm sure you've seen a number of traffic safety campaigns out there that feature blood, guts, and gore, um, tangled messes of, of collisions, that sort of thing. Sometimes that scares people into thinking that they'll never happen to them. It scares them into denial. And that sometimes has the opposite effect of trying to teach them what they can do. It just tells them what they shouldn't do. And they think, well, that's never going to be me. I don't think it'll ever happen to me. And they don't learn the right way to do things. 
So that's where we really want to give them an action and make it clear and concise. And you may recognize this slide from one of my recent presentations, but I wanted to include it here as well. Um, a bit of a story. I used to oversee this high school program where we had injury survivors go into schools and talk to students and share some of the worst decisions they ever made in their lives or someone else made that impacted their life forever. A lot of times these folks um, hadn't buckled their seatbelt before they got behind the wheel of a car or hadn't uh, checked the depth of the water before they dove in or choose to drink or have drugs before they got into a vehicle and ended up breaking their backs or losing limbs. And it really, really changed the trajectory of their lives. And within these shows, it was really important for us to have those stories being told to create a lasting imprint, because now it wasn't just that you need to buckle your seatbelt before you get into a car. It was knowing that a young woman named Missy came to their school and talked about the night that she didn't wear her seatbelt and was in a car collision and lost the use of her legs. And so that creates a story, an imprint, a more meaningful connection. And then the other thing is these stories were always paired with messaging. And we had five messages that kind of covered the scope of, um, you know, different sort of teenage injury prevention that included buckle up, look first, wear the gear, get trained and drive sober. Again, all positive, all tells you what you can do, short, concise, and very action oriented. So again, thinking about that when you're looking at talking to your own teenager tonight, we're talking to your colleagues, or creating something for your local media. How can you create those positive and empowering messages to really cut through and give people solid advice about what they can do? So now, who can we share with? We talked about the messaging and how to make it impactful. Now let's talk about who we talk to. So the thing is, is when we're looking at all of the different ways to talk about safety and share those messages, you really want to focus on who you're talking to as well as the messages. Why do you need to reach them and how can we best connect with them? And really what we look at in traditional marketing is really developing this idea of a customer avatar that almost helps you walk through what this person does, how they act, what their priorities are. And by doing that, you're kind of putting on your detective hat and saying, okay, if this is how they act, and this is what they are interested in, maybe I can kind of, you know, hack my way into um, creating messaging that works for them, that resonates with them, and that meets them where they're at. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. For our safety messages, again, I gave you some examples off the top of why it's important to share these safety messages. Maybe you have a new work site um, that you need people to be aware of. Maybe you want flaggers to feel more protected because you know you've educated the public on the dangers of that job. Maybe you just want to contribute to an overall reduction in speed across your community. Um, maybe you want to just raise awareness around safe driving practices around, around vehicles that are associated with your organization. Or maybe you're sitting on a, a committee or a council within ATSA and you really want to change the face of teen driver safety in your neighborhood or your community. Or maybe you're taking it um, to a higher level at a fly-in and going into DC and discussing some of these important issues with legislators. All of these different audiences require a different approach. And that's where it's really important to, as an organization, have a conversation around how you're meeting those people. So let's talk about this idea of building an avatar. So got my picture of this lovely young woman who's driving her car. And let's just say she's kind of our target. Maybe I'm running a work site on the side of a pretty busy highway um, in my jurisdiction. And one of the things we need to do is really target those nine to five commuters who are driving by every day in rush hour and speeding too much or on their phones. How do we meet them with messaging that will impact them? So the first step is that first column, it's your identity. So this person maybe is a mom or a dad, some sort of parent, they're a nine to five employee. Maybe they're thinking about a new vehicle for purchase. Maybe because you know they're juggling all these different balls, they're multitasking a lot. 
and probably likely they live in the neighborhood, they work pretty close by, and they're making the same sort of trips every day just based on, on their life profile. So what does that mean for the impact? So maybe this person has kids in the car and they're driving the same time every day. Maybe they're considering that new vehicle purchase. And for us, when we're looking at transportation, maybe they're looking at some new self-driving technology um, because they're multitasking all the time. Maybe they're distracted behind the wheel. Maybe they're, there's a greater likelihood they're checking their emails while they're driving. And maybe they're making the same trips every day. So there's a higher likelihood, and we know this from the research, of tuning out. So most car collisions happen when you're very close to home because you kind of go into autopilot. And similarly, if you're driving the same place every single day, you may also go into my autopilot. So then we start to think of all the different messaging that we can have. So maybe a messaging related to their kids or from a kid's perspective is important. Maybe we need to focus on how rush hour may change or how the new technology of a self-driving vehicle may remove that feeling of responsibility, but it's still important to keep eyes up. Multitasking, we can tie into distracted driving. Changes to the route is really important if somebody's tuning out because they make the same trip every day. And then we look at our tactics. So again, we wanna talk about sharing safety in diverse ways. So for this person, maybe having a school flyer come home about changes to the route is really important. Maybe it's making sure you're talking to your radio and TV traffic reporting and inserting some information about route changes and closures in there. Maybe it's partnering with a local car dealership to put up posters about how you still need to be aware even if you have a self-driving car or putting in some print advertising in local media sources or doing educational pre-ads on YouTube. Um, with multitasking, knowing somebody's gonna be on their phone a lot, could we do some more social media work? Or if they're making the same trips every day, how do we need to look at our work site plan and actually add in um, different signage that they're not gonna tune out? So instead of orange signage or yellow signage, do we do the pink signage? Do we have LEDs? Do we put temporary um, LED signs out warning them? There's a lot of different things that we can do to change up that messaging to, um, stoke some new interest. So that's really important. And it's just a micro example of building an avatar, but it's the idea that your audience is always going to be very different. So your approaches have to be different. And you need to think about these audiences as holistic people, because when you look at the entirety of their ecosystem, there's a number of different ways that you can address the issue and connect with them. So now that we've covered all the theory, now we get into kind of some of the fun stuff, is what does sharing safety look like? So I've given you a number of ideas already in terms of what we could do. And some of like the quick, easy wins um, might be to distribute press releases or about new work projects to maybe local businesses, schools, and media. Traditionally, press release would go to the media, but if you're sharing it with local area schools or businesses, that gives you another opportunity to connect to a bigger audience and amplify your voice. You could share on your social media as well as different partners, maybe local law enforcement, emergency services, or even the media. Highlight the work zone from a worker perspective. So maybe you have somebody on the side of the road, a flagger, and you have their perspective and what it looks like when these vehicles are speeding by them quickly. That can really be a wake up call for people. Local media love new stories and new angles of things. So invite them through a walkthrough of work zone changes and talk about what's happening, what's coming up in their community, but also some of the safety impacts. And then of course, activating social media. So making highly shareable content for your own channel, but also creating that media kit or relationship with local enforcement, schools, businesses, and have them share it as well. Some more specific ones. I know that this is very popular, especially in work zones, but putting a face on safety. So personal messages are always going to be that one that impacts. And I told you earlier about the example of our presenters that used to go into high schools and create that, that personal tie for students. And when you start to see signs like my mom and dad work here, please slow down, pictures of children, all of a sudden you're putting a face to safety and no longer is that worker a nameless person, but somebody who has a family. And there's that connection for the drivers and other motorists on the road. 
The other thing that um, sometimes is really impactful is working with local media. And again, I know I keep talking about construction, shutdowns, work zones, because I know that this is a lot of the business that you're focused on, or you supply to some of these businesses that are doing this kind of work. And again, there's always that opportunity for providing more engagement and more story with local media. So not only just sharing about the closures, but like I mentioned earlier, offer a walkthrough. Um, let them do the morning uh, weather or traffic hits from, from your closure. Invite them to sit behind the wheel of some of your heavy machinery, parked of course, um, and do a hit from that. Try to come up with different aspects. It's not always about construction, um, but maybe you know as a kickoff to the spring construction season, you have them do a walkthrough of your facility and do their broadcast from there. Um, maybe as the snow starts falling, have them do it from, if you run a snowplow service, have them do it from your facility or, um, you know, there's a number of different ways that you can get creative about how to create a media friendly story that's got great visuals for something that um, is a little bit lighter in terms of traffic and weather reporting. And you won't necessarily have to compete with um, sort of upcoming issues or stories that are also coming into um, the media. Then what you wanna do is, or another thing that you can do is planning your calendar. And I love highlighting this one, especially this time of year. I know a lot of businesses are planning their budgets for 2023 and planning their plans. And it's really important to have us sit down and think about all of the different things that are coming up. So one of the first things I would say are your key project dates that you've got. So maybe you know you're doing a massive resurfacing project in May, or um, you know, you've got a big contract for next fall. Put it in the calendar and start to think about how you want to share that with local partners, media, and the public. Also highlighting relevant holidays. So I just put a couple of here couple here rather, National Teen Driver Safety Week is in October every year. Um, always a great way to promote safe driving. Mother and Father's Day. So imagine a campaign about uh, mothers and fathers that work at your organization and about keeping them safe. Beginning of summer, when you've got new uh, college and university students who are starting their summer jobs with you is a great time to raise awareness about young, new, inexperienced workers. Back to school, we see a big shift in terms of who's on the road and buses and things like that. Um, daylight savings time is also a really tricky one for road safety that you may want to think about some messaging. And again, remember that you are doing messaging, but your partner's also maybe doing messaging that you can also amplify. And then from there, you develop that content. But when you look at the entirety of the year, it's really helpful to then go in and slot in that those ideas and develop the content rather than starting with an idea for content and trying to figure out how to place it on your calendar. Um, this sharing safety toolkit is something that I've developed for today. Um, and if you're interested, I'll have my email at the end and I can send you this toolkit, which will have uh, sort of a mock uh, social media calendar or project calendar, um, as well as some content ideas. So we've got that for you if you'd like. The other um, thing that you can do when it comes to sharing safety, like I mentioned, it's not just about the work that you're doing, it's about partners and innovation. And it's really important to join those discussions, whether it's happening just within your municipality, at a state level, at a federal level, or with different industries. And I've got Uber up here, I'll talk about them in a moment. But it's really important to look at how changes and updates to legislation or technology are impacting how your organization and its people are being protected. Also, when you're joining these discussions, uh, you can share your feedback and ideas just like at a fly-in. And you can also amplify your message through partnership innovation. And so like I mentioned earlier, Uber um, was one of my previous clients. And what we did for their Canadian um, HQ was we orchestrated this um, safety lab and we brought together 20 organizations, evidence-based organizations, um, government, uh, nonprofits, a number of them to one room and really had an interesting discussion about what their priorities were when it came to road safety. And then we also had from the Uber side, um, their experts in research and development to talk about some of the things that they were doing within their technology 
to create safer streets. But Uber was really missing that experience that only 20 organizations could offer. And those 20 organizations were hungry for a megaphone to help their message, but also very much identifying issues within the Uber platform. This is like five or six years ago that needed some, some attention to make sure that they were still being as safe as possible. And so some of the things that came out of that meeting were, um, uh, it was a geofencing thing where uh, when your ride ended for Uber, you would actually get a pop-up that would say you're stopping in a bike lane. Be careful when you open the door so that you don't hit a cyclist. And uh, so you can see there that the tips on the page came from some of the work that we did in that, that safety lab. And so sometimes it can feel like when you're joining the discussion, it feels like a longer road approach because it takes a really long time for change. But being at the table is so important because if you're not, no one will hear your input or your ideas. The other thing that you wanna do is be prepared. And this is where being both proactive and reactive is really impossible, or excuse me, really important. <laughs> you need to know your key messages, those significant dates I talked about, and the partners that you wanna work with. It's really important to have assets, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, for easy sharing. You want to be able to pitch your stories and your opportunities. So you need to think about what that looks like and write a press release or have key messages. And you want to know who you need to reach out with or reach out to um, at the media. So are you talking to a producer? Are you talking to somebody in transportation? Who's your connection so that you're ready to go when the moment strikes? However, also being reactive. If a new legislation gets passed, could you be a spokesperson to speak about that? If there is an incident in your community, how can you contribute to that? So really with media, we need to balance between being prepared, but also being ready to respond. And with you, you do that by having a communication toolbox. And this is also included in that toolkit that I was talking about, a rundown of all the things that you want. But it's really important to make sure you have assets. So really high quality photos and logos for your organization, having key messages, who you are, what you do, why it's important. Um, any specific data about what you're doing. So we've we've paved 100,000 miles in Kentucky uh, of roadways, or you know we salt all of the major highways within our state, or uh, we employ a thousand workers. Whatever those stats are, they help you have that credibility. Also, having your channel sorted, social media, having a really strong website, these all help your credibility. Having voices, so really great success stories. Um, having spokespeople who are ready to discuss key messages with media and that are comfortable going on camera. Partners, whether that's emergency services, other organizations, um, but really a combined group that you can work with to communicate those messages. And then of course, that really strong plan like that media calendar I talked about. This case study is actually a really cool one. Um, recently, I was traveling and I was sitting there on the plane and I was trying to find something to watch. And I came up on this show called Heavy Rescue 401. And if you're not from the Toronto region of Canada, uh, you have no idea what the 401 is, but it's a very big, big highway. Um, I think at its widest, it's about 12 or 16 lanes and it's notorious for collisions. And I was delighted to see that the show was on my national airline um, as I flew to Mexico, but um, they were showing this heavy rescue 401. And basically it's the show that, that shows what it's like to do a heavy rescue. And it features um, vehicle um, crane operators and tow trucks, and then local police, both um, regional and provincial police and our ministry of transportation, which is, um, our provincial, so like a state uh, level of transportation organization. And it's really interesting because this is something that's totally mainstream. It's on Discovery Channel and it's got a pretty big fan following. And I think they're going into their sixth season and it really provides education through entertainment. So this is totally different than a number of the tactics I've talked about, but it was a really interesting one because in every episode you see these horrible crashes and it's really fascinating to see how they pull them out but there's always the police officer sergeant Kerry schmidt who's a friend of mine 
and talking about what could have gone wrong or what did go wrong and how it could have been prevented. And so there's a great balance of messaging within this larger educate or entertainment piece that really makes the show not only um, sort of an easy watch, but also provides a little bit more positive reinforcement and empowerment about how that situation could have been different. And I think this one was also received funding from the province to make sure it happened. The other one that I love is this Think of Me campaign, which is out of British Columbia. And for drivers that were caught speeding in designated school zones, they received a ticket and they also received a hand-drawn, uh, colored in uh, comic from a child in that school zone. And it was scheduled around spring break when there was a change in their kind of routine in terms of kids being out of school and back in school. And it was, again, just a great way to provide a little bit of a disruption of a typical ticketing scene and give people pause to think about what they were doing and the potential implications. And it was a very successful campaign. And it was a partnership, again, between the school district, the police, and the provincial um, insurance brokerage. And so, again, partnership and messaging and attacking an issue from an entirely different channel or angle to change and disrupt the way that people were thinking. So I know we're tight on time here, so I'll just wrap it up. But really what I wanted to focus on here today is that sharing safety should be a dynamic process. It's, so it's always changing and it's part of it, every organization's planning. Your messages, they really need to be positive, sticky and constant. And that understanding your audience is key so that you can reach them appropriately. Variability is very important for your audience and their reception. So it's not just one message in one way, but all of these different channels to make sure that you're getting them in all of these different angles. Working with your partners will always amplify your voices. And you always need to be proactive and reactive with your toolkit ready to go. And like I promised, that one uh, is available. So if you are interested, just shoot me a note and I'll send you a PDF later this week with a full toolkit to help you on your way to sharing safety. So thanks so much. And I'll turn it back to Pamela and Heather. Thank you, Alex. Um, we don't have any questions today in the Q&A, um, but thank you again for your time. Um, we will be posting the recording of this webinar on our website in two to three business days. There will be a short survey that will pop up at, um, when we disconnect the webinar. So if you would please take a moment to fill that out and provide uh, feedback to us. Um, so again, thank you, Alex, for your time. And thank you to everyone who attended. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.